All right, now we can start playing with some of the theoretical constructs dealing with Maxwell's equations after the correction that Maxwell noticed and input it um, regarding how uh, the changing or the curl of the magnetic field has to have some kind of um, electric fuel component in it, much like uh, Faraday's law had the curl of the electric field has some kind of magnetic field component. All right, so moving forward, the statement says, suppose that E, which is a function of R and T, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared uh, times theta of VT minus R, R hat, and B of R of T is equal to 0. Okay, recall that the theta here is just representative of the step function. Every book has a different notation for it, so I'm sorry if it throws you off. Uh, what we want to do is show that these fields satisfy all of the Maxwell's equations and determine rho and j. Describe the physical situation that gives rise to these fields. All right, so let's go to our no. Our Maxwell's equations, we have four of them. One being Gauss's law, two being um, Faraday's law, three being a uh, really no name, but it just means that we don't have a magnetic monopole and four being Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction. I wrote them like this simply because I agree with what the author says um, in respect to how to illustrate them. We say here that um, Maxwell's equations tell you how charges produce fields reciprocally, reciprocally, can't speak. The force tells you how the fields affect charges. So I, I agree with writing them in this form where we say that... Um, we're looking at what the charges do to the fields and so forth. So fields on one side, charges on another. All right, anyways, then we uh, have to recall that we have a product rule here that we're going to have to invoke. So I'll just put that there for a quick reference. A is, some, A is the sum vector, not the magnetic vector potential, FYI. And then the step function as uh, defined tells us that we have 1 for x greater than 0 and 0 for, S le for x less than 0. But we also proved back in chapter 1 that the derivative of the step function was equal to the Dirac delta. And we'll see how that becomes handy really quickly. All right. So if we're looking at this, was what the heck does this field mean with respect to the step function? And so physically what this is saying is that the field of a point charge, notice that we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. That is a point charge. Q at the origin, okay, and uh, what it's saying is that out to an expanding spherical shell of radius vt, velocity times t gives you distance, so it makes sense. Outside the shell, the field is zero, which is uh, surmised in the step function itself. And then evidently, the shell carries the opposite charge, uh, negative q. This becomes, this is the, re the reason why this is because the field outside the shell is zero, so the two charges in the Gaussian surface have to cancel. <laughs> So let's write out what the step function is. The step function for v minus or v t minus r, we have to plug that into where we had x in its definition, and we see that we have one where v of t is greater than r, and zero for v of t less than r. Okay, so again, makes sense. And then if we actually define the field in this piecewise definition, we see here that that's the point charge, and we see we have a point charge for v of t greater than r. And we have zero for um, less than V of T less than R. Okay. So there's a time component and a distance component put together via the velocity. And uh, now we can move forward uh, with this after we describe this field. And uh, if we want to check Maxwell's equations, we have to take the divergence of this electric field. That's what his first equation tells us. So if we take this, we see that the step function is a scalar and the point charge part of the field is a vector because of the r hat direction. So what we need to do is use the product rule that we mentioned. So we take the divergence of the uh, point charge part and then we take the dot product of the point charge part with the gradient of the scalar part and then we just shove it through. Um, notice that in the third line, we have q over 4 pi epsilon naught. That's just a constant. Push it out. And then we see that we just have the divergence of r hat over r squared. We've seen this before. It's a very important rule in the theory. It's probably the most important to why this theory works. Uh, again, go back to chapter 1 if you need more reassurance. 
And then here we have, uh, well, clearly the only part that matters in this dot product is the gradient with respect to the um, radial direction. So we need an R hat, R hat. And that's why we only take the derivative of D by DR of the step function. Okay, so if we see here that the divergence of that 1 over R squared in the R hat direction, that just goes to 4 pi delta cubed R, okay? Where R is equal to the X, Y, Z, that whole thing. We see that the 4 pi is cancel. We like that. And then in the second part of the product rule, we have, uh, well, the dot product is 1, and then we apply the derivative of the step function, carry that through. That gives us a delta plus a, or times a negative 1 due to chain rule. And now we just simplify it down. Okay, so what we see here is that we get Q over epsilon naught, the three-dimensional delta, times the step function, minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q over R squared, times the delta. Okay, but let's recall here that the delta shifts everything to the origin point. So with that, if we're at the origin, we need to put uh, that R and V cancel to one another because we're at, at the origin, they need to be equal. So it shifts the step function to T only. So here, if we solve Gauss's law for rho, which is what we want, then we see we have rho equals epsilon naught times the divergence of E, and then we can just plug it in, seeing, noting that epsilon naught's cancel in both terms uh, whenever you multiply it in. So we get rho is equal to Q times the three-dimensional Dirac delta times the step function as a function of time. Again, this reinforces the fact that this charge is at the origin. And then we have minus, the minus sign, of the fact that the uh, field, the spherical shell propagating out, you know, the minus sign is there to cancel out whatever field was produced at the origin. So physically, we're getting exactly what we're expecting. That's pretty cool. All right, kind of a hard way to write it, but it does satisfy the equation. Now, for all the other equations for, or excuse me, before we get to that, for time t equals zero, the field and the charge density are zero everywhere. Okay, that was summarized by the step function as well. Now, clearly, we were given that b of r of t is equal to zero, so taking any spatial derivatives would yield zero, too. And that's what we see here. Clearly, uh, the divergence of b is equal to zero since the magnetic field that was given was zero. And similarly, we can use the spherical curl for e is zero using the fact that we know that the field only having a radial component that is independent of theta and phi well, when we look at the spherical curl, we know that the partial derivatives are with respect to theta and phi, and since they only have a radial component, they all cancel to zero. So that was kind of nice. Uh, use your, you know, just use insight on that. Save yourself a couple calculations. Uh, but since the magnetic field is zero, so is its time derivative. Thus, we know that equation two will yield zero, and equation three will yield zero. So everything is verified, um, or at least... Uh, solid within the theory. Now that all that remains is the Ampere with Maxwell's correction law. Um, okay, so here if we type this out, we see that we get uh, the curl of B minus mu naught epsilon naught uh, time derivative of E is equal to mu naught J. Clearly we see that the curl of B is zero due to B being zero. And, you know, if we simplify that, then we see here that we get a cancellation of mu naughts on both sides. So this one solves for the current density pretty quickly. And then we're just here to solve, take the derivative of the electric field with respect to time. We see that we get a cancellation of epsilon naughts again. And we see that we get a negative, okay, recall the negative, um, the V, yeah, we get a negative from the uh, law. And then we get negative Q over four pi R squared. Uh, v with the Dirac delta in the r hat direction. And what this says is the stationary charge at the origin does not contribute to j. Makes sense. Of course, for the expanding shell, because you need to have something that's moving for there to be a current, and we have j is equal to rho v, which is as expected. That's pretty cool. I love how consistent it is.